morning, church. This morning's scripture, as you can see, will be from Psalms chapter 116. We're going to go verses 1 through 6. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version this morning. So maybe yeah, it'll be a little different than up there. Psalms 116, 1 through 6. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. The courts of death encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Amen. Why don't you sing with me real quick? God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He cares for so good to me. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to of you believe that this morning he is so good even amidst the difficulties of life God is good and God is faithful and I think that's what the psalmist is trying to get across to us in Psalm 116 we're continuing our series of lessons today from our devotional guide back in the fall and uh, John Daka wrote uh, a devotional uh, number 19 in your in your booklet someone that we can turn to for comfort it's interesting the the timing I guess ironic or a godsend I don't know that uh, this would fall uh, when it does for me but uh, I got I, I've got to let you know that that it's not about me it's about him and it's about the fact as we were talking in the back before we came out to begin the worship service it's about the fact that everybody's dealing with something and everybody is in need of comfort from God all of us you know we we we've all had tragedies we've all had disappointments we've all had discouragements we've all had uh, difficulties in our lives and maybe even at this moment you're dealing with something that nobody else knows about but God knows and God loves you and God is so good he is so good the psalmist says, God is merciful. The New American Standard says, God is compassionate. And he loves you. And he wants to help you. He wants to help you today. Thank you for being here today. If you're visiting with us, thank you for your presence. We greatly appreciate you being a part of our worship uh, today as we come before the throne of God and, and exalt him high for who he is and for what he has done. Uh, we appreciate your presence to our members. It's good to see you here. I know we have many who are traveling, as it is that time of the year uh, when people go to visit family and go on vacations, but we are thankful for your presence this morning. Would you pray with me as we begin? Holy Father, you are truly a good, merciful, compassionate, awesome God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for providing for us. And we thank you, Father, for this avenue of worship where we can connect with you and come before you and acknowledge how amazing you are. Father, as we look into your word, we ask you to speak to our hearts. 
penetrate our minds and our hearts with your word, that we may be blessed, that we may be encouraged, and that we may be changed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In his devotional uh, comments, John made a couple of points that I, I wanted to bring forward as we begin our lesson today. He's, the first thing he says is we live in a world full of tragedy, disappointments, and hardships. And you know, you don't have to be alive for very long to realize the truthfulness of that statement. We live in a fallen world. You know, we live in a beautiful part of the world here in the Northwest. And you look up and you see Mount Rainier. Or you look out and you see the Puget Sound. And, and you see the mountains and the trees and uh, the bald eagles flying around. You see all these beautiful things. Can you imagine what the world looked like before it was tainted by sin? If it's this beautiful in a sin-fallen world, how beautiful was it before? It must have been something else. But we, we have to deal with hardships. We have difficulties. And the problem is, too many times, he says, we look for fixes in our lives through the things of this world. And when we do, we find all the same things. In other words, the fixes of the world only lead to further tragedy, disappointments, and hardships. So where do we turn? Well, we need someone that we can turn to for comfort and encouragement during these times. I invite you to turn to Psalm 34. Obviously not our scripture reading, but we'll be returning to that momentarily. Psalm 34. One of the amazing things about the Psalms to me is you get to see the emotions, the full spectrum of emotions of the people of God throughout time. You get to see their triumphs and their tragedies, their hurts, their disappointments, the loneliness, sin. You get to see all of those things and how those impact us emotionally. The joy, the tears, the sorrow, depression. You see those through the words, through the lens, as it were, of the Psalms looking back to God's people years and years ago. And we see that things really haven't changed. Our setting may have changed. The calendar may have changed, but people are still the same. We still deal with all the same things. The psalmist writes, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Do you think David understood difficulties? Many are the afflictions, he says. Imagine if, if David were preaching this and he says, many are the afflictions, he would get a resounding amen from everybody here. Because the longer you live, the more you see, the more you realize, and the more you understand there are difficulties in this life. However, that's not the end of the story. The, story. the Lord delivers him out of most of them. The Lord delivers them out of the majority of them. What does he say? The Lord delivers them out of them all. Now, what God's deliverance looks like and what our expectations are don't always match up, do they? But God does deliver us from them all. And for some of us, it may ultimately, ultimately be the deliverance that we receive when we're released from this earthly body. But he's going to deliver the righteous. Those who have placed their trust in God will understand and receive that deliverance. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes to a struggling church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And he opens his letter with the following here in verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort 
with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Notice how he opens referring to God as the God of what? All comfort. Kind of takes us back to delivers us from all of the afflictions. He's the God of all comfort. If there is any true and abiding comfort that you experience, ultimately its source is from God. Ultimately, that's where it comes from. He is the God of all comfort. And I want us to look at this for just a few moments as we're mindful of someone that we can turn to. First of all, God himself, our merciful Father, is where we turn to for comfort. In Psalm 116, verse 5, the, the Lord is merciful, the Lord is compassionate, as Joel just read for us. And here, Paul writes, he is the Father of mercies. He's the merciful Father. You know, we have a difficult time in this world thinking about God as our Father because a lot of us didn't have good fathers. And one of the problems that we have is we tend to view God our Father through the prism or the lens of how we viewed our earthly father. And if you had a loving, good, kind father, that's how you see God. If you had a harsh disciplinarian for a father... That's how you view God. And we, as we mature, we have to separate ourselves from our earthly father, who is a man with feet of clay, no matter how good he is. He's a human being with faults. We have to separate our view of him from a merciful father, the father of fathers, the one who loves his children. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And by the way, if you're not in the habit of coming on Sunday night, tonight we're going to be looking at 1 John. And so I would encourage you to come back if that uh, would be an encouragement to you. But God himself, he, he presents himself to us as a comforter, as a father. You, you need look no further than this table and what we just did around this table to see how much the father loves you. Romans 5 and verse 8, God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, when we get around this table, there's what, something we've got to remember the men that are leading this table and those of us that are uh, partaking of these elements, we've got to remember that this is not about us. This is about God and what he did. It's not about us. It's not about anything that you or I do. This is about the love demonstrated by the Father to a fallen creation. He sent Jesus to bear our sin in his body and to shed his precious blood to wash away those sins in our lives. And that's what we remember. We remember what God did for us. He is a merciful father. And I'm going to tell you, of all the things that can happen in this world, it, you could have the most tragic life and be covered by the blood of Christ. And when you escape the bonds of this earth and go into eternity, you will know everything was worth it because of the comfort with which you're going to be comforted by the Father. But all of the tragedies that we experience in this life, we still are receiving comfort on this side of eternity from God himself. Why would the Holy Spirit inspire Paul to write the Father of mercies and God of all comfort if we could not experience those things in this life? Because certainly we can. 
The second thing that this uh, scripture teaches us, well, let's, let's back up. We experience God's comfort through prayer, communicating with God, through studying, allowing Him to communicate with us, and by sometimes just being still and meditating on the things of God, the things that we've been studying, the things that we are praying for. God can, can work in and through these avenues to provide us comfort. You know, we, we had a class on prayer about a year and a half ago on Wednesday nights. And one of the things that I brought out, and this, this was an epiphany to me quite a few years ago when I started actually studying what prayer is. Prayer is not for God. He didn't ask us to pray because he wants to hear how great he is. Prayer is for our benefit, for us to, to communicate, to verbalize the, the deep down hurts and disappointments and the thanksgivings and, and the joy. He wants us to express those things to him because he knows that that is beneficial to us to express those things. And when we express to him the hurt that we are feeling, you know what that is? That's an outlet. And once we allow that outlet to exist in our lives of communicating to him, now God can come in because we've opened the door. We've opened the door for God to come in and help us deal with whatever the circumstance of life is that we have before us. Secondly, God gives us brothers and sisters in Christ. He not only says the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our tribulation, but he says that we, who's the we? Brothers and sisters in Christ may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received. Wow. You know, sometimes we need something with skin on, right? You know, God's wherever God is, you know, I, I know you're there, God, and, but, you know, sometimes I just, I need a hug, right? I need somebody to just come put their arm around me. You know, sometimes we just need something with skin on, and God knows that. And what does God do? He sends you other people who have been comforted. It's amazing to me how comforting it is to comfort someone else. It's a reciprocal. And, and you may not even reala realize how much you need comforting and you go to comfort someone else and you walk away comforted. Almost like God knew what he was doing, right? <laughs> Funny how that works. God is so good. And he sends us people, people with hurts and disappointments. You know, there, there's a saying that hurt people hurt people. Right? Hurt people hurt people. But you know, comforted people comfort people. People who understand comfort, the fact that they've had to experience it because of difficulties in their life, are able to in turn offer it to others also. You can pray with and pray for someone in their time of need, and you can be with them. Sometimes you can share uh, what you've gone through in your life when the time is right, it's not always the right time to talk about yourself. But you can share with them and how God brought you through the difficult times in your life. And lastly, he says, consolation. We are consoled through Christ. What a beautiful idea that is. The Hebrew writer quoting from the Old Testament in Hebrews 13, the second part of verse 5 says, The wonderful promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to tell you something that if you've been around long enough, you've probably experienced, but the, every person on earth will disappoint you at one time or another. Every single person, your spouse, your children, your parents, they'll all disappoint you. And it may just be because your expectations were not fair. 
but, but sometimes they disappoint you because their actions did not turn out the way that they should be. You know, every person, your preacher, your elders, your Bible class teachers, we're all going to disappoint you at some point in time in your life. But Jesus will never disappoint. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will always be there. And then the Hebrew writer goes on to say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So not only is he never going to leave you or forsake you, he's never going to change. You know, we change. Hopefully for the better, but we change. Jesus can't get any better, and he never changes. He's always the same. Philippians 4.13, a misapplied verse in so many circumstances of, of life. Paul is talking about learning to abound and learning to be abased. Being hungry, being filled. Being clothed, being naked. Going through all of the highs and lows of life. And through all of those circumstances, he says, I can endure. That's ultimately what the verse means. I can endure all things through whom? Through Christ who gives me strength. Through Christ. Because you know what? When you look at the, the life that Jesus had on this earth and you see the discouragement and disappointments and heartaches and suffering that he went through and yet he never lost sight of what was important. Wow. He's been there. He's done that. You know, God the Father intellectually and, and I'm not trying to demean God, so please hear me all the way through this. Intellectually, he, doesn't, he might know what it is to be a human, but experientially, he doesn't. But through his son, Jesus Christ, he experienced every aspect of humanity, not in an intellectual way, but he experienced it. Boots on the ground. And Jesus, the one who dealt with being trapped in this tent, who knows what it feels like, who understands the temptation, who understands the heartaches, who understands all of these things, he endured to the end without sin. And therefore, he is that great high priest that we can turn to. He's the one who can console us. He is the one through whom we, we receive our strength to endure. Back to our scripture reading in Psalm 116, 1 through 6. I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me and the pains of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore you to deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. First thing I want you to notice is we have a God who hears. We have a God who hears. When you cry out to God, he hears your cry. It does not fall on deaf ears. Secondly, he is a God of mercy a God of compassion, a God who cares about the circumstance of life you find yourself in. And lastly, he is a God who not only hears, he's not only a God that has compassion, but he is a God who can and will save you. He will deliver you from whatever circumstance you are in. And in the end, he will save you eternally. God is so good. He provides for us what we ourselves cannot provide. And as we said just a few moments ago, he demonstrated how good he was when he sent Jesus to that cross. And he did that for you and he did that for me. Jesus loved you enough to go to that cross and look down across the years and see you see you lost in your sin 
and hanging there with nails in his hands and his feet and a crown of thorns on his head and people mocking him, you were on his mind and he said, Father, I'm going to die for him or her. I'm going to bear his sins. I'm going to bear her sins. I'm going to make them mine so they don't have to go through this. Now that's love. Jesus says, believe in me. Jesus says, confess your belief. Jesus says, turn from the sins in your life for which I died. Repent of those things. And Jesus says, come join me in my death, burial, and resurrection to have your sins washed away. That is being immersed or baptized in water for the remission of your sins to be raised to walk in a new life, a forgiven life. If you've not done those things, we are ready to help you with that to begin your journey today. Maybe you've done those things. And maybe, like a very dear preacher friend of mine told me a long time ago, there's pain on every pew. Maybe you're suffering today. Maybe you need to come to the God of all comfort. Maybe you need us to pray with you and pray for you and come alongside and encourage you today. Whatever your need is, we're about to sing a song, Where Could I Go But To The Lord. Folks, there's nowhere else to go. Come join me down front as together we stand and sing.